Welcome to PowerPoint Tuesday, your weekly deep dive into the Word of God. I'm your host, Pastor Jeremiah, here to guide you through the sacred scriptures with clarity and insight. Get ready for an enlightening journey of faith brought to you through the power of PowerPoint. Let's journey together into the heart of the Bible right here on PowerPoint Tuesday. Amen. As we have been accustomed to doing, uh, we will review what our objective has been for this study uh, so that we can always stay on track and understand why and what we want to come away with as we finish this study. This eight-part Bible study on the Holy Spirit aims to deepen our understanding of the Holy Spirit's role and activity in our lives as interpreted from a Wesleyan perspective. Through a combination of scriptural exploration, historical insights, and practical applications, we will discover how the Holy Spirit empowers, transforms, and sustains us in our Christian journey. We will also reflect on key Wesleyan themes such as prevenient grace, sanctification, and the means of grace, ultimately seeking a more profound and personal experience of the Holy Spirit working among us. Amen. Um, uh, As we go into this study, I do have a question that I'd like you to consider, and that is, what does the word charismatic mean to you? What does the word charismatic mean to you? And while you're thinking about that, I welcome Sister Marilyn Monmouth, Sister Carla Lewis, Sister Ruth Price, and Sister Deborah Smith. Uh, thank you so much for that. We, we, we welcomed Deborah Smith earlier, but no no harm in welcoming you again. Uh, praise the Lord. Um, What does charismatic, what does the word charismatic mean to you? You can think about it just from uh, the dictionary definition. You can consider it from a um, a, a religious church definition in the context of church. But when you hear the word charismatic, what do you think of? And while you're thinking of that, I will go ahead and, and, and share a review of what we spoke on last week. First of all, last week we talked about the historical renewal movements and we discussed Old Testament and New Testament examples of uh, how the Holy Spirit renewed God's people, the people of Israel in the Old Testament and and the disciples and the the, uh, inauguration of the church in the New Testament. Uh, And both of those examples consistently include repentance and a return to God. And in the New Testament, a focus on the work of Jesus Christ. We discussed uh, the seven elements of renewal overall. And then we discussed the six factors that contributed to the uh, success and spread of the Wesleyan renewal as a part of the first great awakening. And tonight, we will be discussing the contemporary charismatic movement. We will be defining uh, charisma, charismatic. We'll be defining and discussing the Christian charismatic charismatic experience. We'll discuss the term uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. We will talk about the gifts of the Spirit uh, at a high level because we will go with it, go to those in detail in our next study. And then we will discuss some recommended guidelines for church charismatic experiences. Some recommended guidelines for church charismatic experiences. Amen. And so the question was, when you hear the word charismatic, what do you think of? Uh, Thank you, Sister Carla Lewis. Attractive. Right. When when you hear the term charismatic, you think of a person that has a, a charismatic personality. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, our, our, our younger folks, our, our Gen Z and maybe even our uh, Gen Alpha uh, generation, they use this word riz. And riz is short for charisma. It, it speaks of a person who uh, has the, the the characteristics that draw people to themselves. Uh, me being Generation X, we'd use the term that uh, he got game, right? She got game. But today they use the term riz as short for charismatic or charisma, uh, that attractive personality. Um, Deborah Smith says gift. It means uh, gift, and and uh, if we're speaking specifically in uh, literal terms, uh, she is correct. When we talk about the idea of uh, charismatic, we understand that to uh, mean gift. So let's go ahead and define that. First of all, 
if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, it says this from the New King James Version, there are a diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There is a diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. Gifts here in the Greek is charisma, charisma. And that means a gift of grace and an undeserved benefit. Uh, it also specifically speaks to gifts imparted by the Holy Spirit to Christians. And in uh, various contexts of scriptures, including 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 13 and 14, among others, it includes the instantaneous enablement of the Holy Spirit in the life of any believer to exercise a gift for the edification of others. The instantaneous enablement of the Holy Spirit in the life of any believer to exercise a gift for the edification of others. And so when we think about uh, charismatic, and when we think about charisma in the context of the church, in the context of uh, the, the, the Christian experience, we think about it at that level. And so it's important then to uh, understand how that lends itself to what a um, charismatic movement is. What is a charismatic movement? Well, a charismatic movement uh, speaks of those groups of Christians who emphasize certain special gifts or manifestations of the Holy Spirit in addition to the gift of salvation. Those groups of Christians who emphasize certain special gifts or manifestations of the Holy Spirit in addition to the gift of salvation. And so we may hear that people go to a charismatic church. Well, there's no such thing as a charismatic doctrine, right? Uh, there's a Baptist doctrine, there is a Methodist doctrine, there is a Lutheran doctrine, but there is no charismatic doctrine. Char the, there was a charismatic movement that was very uh, exclusive in the early church, and as we'll learn later, uh, began to be embraced uh, by the Protestant uh, in Catholic Church, but there is really no such thing as a charismatic doctrine. And when you really think about it, uh, even when you take denominations out of the equation, there is no such thing as any other doctrine but biblical doctrine. And then we uh, uh, it, we allow bib the Bible to inform our understanding uh, of doctrine. Amen. So we're going to talk about the charismatic movement, both uh, from a historical perspective and kind of a timeline on what leads to uh, where we are today. But when we talk about spiritual gifts, uh, and again, we'll speak to that at a high level, uh, the charismatic movement uh, added emphasis on these manifestations and these gifts in addition to the gift of salvation. Uh, and so what are those spiritual gifts? Well, there are three sets of scriptures that we primarily look to in terms of a list of spiritual gifts. And there are other scriptures that refer to a, a gift here or gifts there. But these three uh, sets of scriptures are, are really uh, uh, the high level list, right, of spiritual gifts when we think of it in those contexts. First uh, Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, list the nine uh, uh, gifts of the Spirit that are usually your uh, power gifts, the gifts that are supernatural gifts of the Spirit, those being words of wisdom and words of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, uh, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. When most people think of, uh, of spiritual gifts, uh, they think of the supernatural gifts in that list. Uh, but we also hear Paul speak of uh, spiritual gifts in Romans 12, 6, and 8, and some of these overlap, but he speaks of uh, gifts of prophecy and service and teaching and encouraging and giving and leadership and kindness. And uh, in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, he speaks of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Well, you might say, well, pastor, those sound like titles and roles. They don't sound like uh, gifts. Well, that is correct. But what Paul does say is that he's given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers as a gift to the church. And so those roles have a, uh, a special responsibility to 
uh, select ministers to serve as a gift to the church. And now we'll understand the purpose of these spiritual gifts, because if we go back and look at those same scriptures or in the same areas of those scriptures, we understand that uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, that the gifts of the spirit were for the common good. Verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 12 says, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So the spiritual gifts uh, are so that we can help each other. The spiritual gifts are so that we can help each other. And then when we look at the theme of the, the, the gifts listed in Romans 12, 6, and 8, these are gifts that are uh, to serve one another. They're to serve one another. And then in Ephesians 4, uh, 11 through 13, we see that the apostle, prophet, the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are a gift to the church. And that gift is given to the church for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. And so the common theme we see in these spiritual gifts is that they are given to us by the Holy Spirit so that we can help one another, so that we can serve one another, and so that we can develop one another onto Christian perfection. Amen. And so now when we think about spiritual gifts in that aspect, we really need to uh, understand uh, how we emphasize and prioritize those spiritual gifts. Uh, but in order to do that too, I think it's important that we look at uh, a timeline of the charismatic movement. Uh, because when we look at, uh, if we pick it up where we left off last week, and that's with the, the Wesleyan revivals, uh, we see that uh, there was a, 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 a great awakening that included uh, uh, mass conversions to Christianity. And if you look at uh, history there, and, and there are various writings that speak of uh, uh, spiritual and charismatic experiences. Now, they didn't call it that then, but they there are testimonies of uh, individuals being healed, speaking in tongues, uh, uh, and, ha and giving words of prophecy at these uh, uh, services that John Wesley and others uh, that were a part of the uh, first great awakening were leading. And so when we think about that, we must understand that uh, John Wesley did not deny the uh, present utilization, the present existence, and the present availability of spiritual gifts uh, to the church. Uh, matter of fact, when he talked about uh, the uh, utilization of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit, he talks about that being a second work of grace. And that second work of grace was sanctification. Remember, we talked a couple of weeks ago about how the Holy Spirit is involved in every part of our uh, uh, salvation experience. And after the new birth, then we begin the, a new beginning towards sanctification. And sanctification is that second work of grace. And a part of that second work of grace are the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are available because of the continued presence of the Holy Spirit that make the soul holy. In other words, uh, John Wesley saw the gifts of the Spirit as an element and a tool that existed within that second work of grace toward making yourself and others holy. It was for the purposes of sanctification. And then we have um, another evangelist, and those of you who have the student book will have seen this by the name of uh, Charles Finney. Uh, Charles Finney, who was uh, very much inspired by the teachings of Wesley. Uh, he was actually born a year after Wesley died, and he began to really emphasize the idea of uh, holiness and actually popularized the term of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the, he, this would be equivalent to what uh, Wesley spoke of in terms of sanctification as a second work of grace. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is that second work of grace that begins us toward the road of, of holiness and sanctification. As a matter of fact, uh, Charles Grandison Finney would plant the seeds of the uh, holiness movement at the time. And so as that began to be preached and Charles Finney was a very, very uh, uh, had a very 
big emphasis on things like revival and prayer. And he wrote many, many, many books on prayer. And he wrote many, many books on uh, holiness. And that was an emphasis of his. Uh, uh, and, and but but what began to lead into the charismatic experience uh, are uh, in the early 1900s when we have uh, folks like Charles Parham and William Seymour. Charles Parham was a white former Methodist who was a teacher, uh, and he was actually a professor who taught uh, William J. Seymour, a black man who uh, had to sit outside of Parham's classroom just in order to hear his teachings on the Holy Spirit. And as he learned about uh, the Holy Spirit and the experiences of Pentecost, then the experiences of Pentecost and sign, signs, wonders, and miracles began to be the focus. And he carried that message to Azusa Street in California. And about 1907, that's where we hear about the Azusa Street revivals, the Azusa Street revivals. And you have folks like William Seymour and Frank Bartleman and, and others who were big parts of that movement. And those emphasis were on uh, those gifts of speaking in tongues and prophecy and healing and working of miracles. And that was primarily what those revivals consisted of to uh, encourage others to have that same experience of the spirit. And so uh, while John Wesley and Charles Finney focused their emphasis on sanctification and holiness, uh, uh, the early uh, 19th uh, century Pentecostals, uh, or rather 20th century in the 1900s, uh, made the emphasis on spiritual gifts, right? But one of the things and one of the problems with that movement is they discredited things like higher education. And they discredited things like medical in intervention in favor of only Holy Spirit inspired teaching without actual study or, or, or education or only faith healing without the intervention of doctors. And, and so uh, that began to be a problem with uh, modern day Protestants who still valued education and still encouraged uh, doctors involvement, right? Uh, especially those Protestants who did not believe that the gifts of spirit were uh, even uh, relevant or available in the present time. Uh, but what we see is that the uh, early charismatic movement began in the early 1900s with these revivals that had an emphasis on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? And so now as we move forward into uh, the early 1900s and as we start to see uh, the Azusa Street revivals uh, encourage other Pentecostal movements, uh, we see them planting to the seeds of what we now know as uh, the Church of God in Christ, or the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, or the United Pentecostal Church, right? Uh, all of those Pentecostal denominations find their roots in the early Pentecostal movements of the 1900s that were started with folks like Charles Parham and uh, William Seymour. Uh, but what we've got to remember too is that these individuals were inspired by Wesleyan teachings. They were inspired by Wesleyan teachings. And so it's important to understand that being inspired by the Wesleyan teachings of sanct sanctification and holiness uh, began to lead down this road of what we now know as the charismatic experience and then eventually became uh, what is now known as neo-Pentecostalism. Neo-Pentecostalism. Now, what is that? Neo-Pentecostalism is the introduction of the charismatic experience in Catholic and Protestant churches. Because around this time, uh, your mainline Protestant churches and your mainline Catholic churches did not, either they did not recognize the spiritual gifts or they did not emphasize the spiritual gifts, right? And so the more the, the charismatic movement began to uh, really spread, we start to see the mainline Catholic church and Protestant churches embrace these experiences within their churches. The difference is they still continue to favor higher education. They encouraged higher education, especially higher education in terms of uh, the Bible, right? They also encouraged medical intervention alongside prayer. So uh, definitely pray and have faith for your healing, but go to the doctor, 
<laughs> right? Uh, uh, I've, I've always heard it said, you can have Jesus and a therapist, right? <laughs> you can have Jesus and a psychologist. And, and, and so um, I, I'd like to say that that is a wise balance, right, with that approach for those uh, mainline Protestant churches that uh, embrace the charismatic movement within their uh, church and their congregation. Higher education is important. It doesn't take away from the fact that the Holy Spirit can inspire your teaching and your preaching. That's why we have the supernatural gifts of the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge uh, and prophecy and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and then what the attempt was is to avoid uh, divisiveness through an ecumenical spirit, to avoid divisiveness through an ecumenical spirit. In other words, we're going to embrace the charismatic movement, but we're not going to uh, embrace it in a way that excludes others who have not had that experience, right? Uh, we will continue to create an environment where uh, charismatic experiences uh, are uh, uh, embraced and opened, but we will not dissuade away or, or push away uh, those who have not had uh, or not aware of being able to have those experiences, and 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 that cre that was the the cause of many problems as the charismatic movement began to spread. Amen. So now, when we think about uh, the uh, co the excuse me the contemporary charismatic movement in terms of what it looks like today, especially what it looks like in our Protestant churches, and more specifically our Methodist churches, um, what does that look like? What does that look like? Um, well, those of you who have the student book will have seen uh, uh, five characteristics of a contemporary charismatic movement, five characteristics of a contemporary charismatic movement. And that looks like an urgent need for renewing power of Holy Spirit. I asked you last week, why does the church need a renewal? Right. I heard answers like complacency. I heard answers like um you know, the uh, uh, reduction of membership. I heard answers that uh, people are just not taking church seriously, but there is a uh, need and an urgent need for the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. And what that also looks like is the understanding that the spiritual gifts are available now in specific ways and miracles should be expected. The spiritual gifts are available now in specific ways and miracles should be expected as a part of that renewal. Uh, also, miracles and manifestations are for blessing and edifying others. So the manifestations of the gifts of the spirit aren't just to show off spiritual gifts. They should lead to the uh, edification of others. They should lead to what Wesley continued to emphasize, and that is sanctification, and what Finney continued to emphasize, and that is holiness. Uh, among these gifts that were that we see as really utilized most often, or at least visible most often, are those such as speaking in tongues and interpretation, prophecy and healing. So when most people think of uh, the charismatic experience uh, by today's terms, that's usually what they think of. They think of tongues, interpretation, prophecy, and healing. They think of faith healing and things like that. Um, and then they really don't think of, um, you know, words of knowledge, words of, uh, words of wisdom, the discerning of spirits and working of miracles and gifts of faith. Because when you really think about it, all of those gifts tend to overlap these other gifts. They kind of feed into each other. We'll talk about that a little more even as we go into our next study. But then what we also understand from the charismatic movement is that these gifts were in addition to the gift of salvation, not a prerequisite. They were in addition to the gift of salvation, not a prerequisite. In early parts of the charismatic movement, and even some uh, charismatic um, uh, folks now will make these certain experiences particularly when we hear folks say receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues as a prerequisite for salvation. Uh, those uh, mainline Protestant churches that uh, embrace the charismatic movement from a rightful biblical perspective will view it as an addition to the gift of salvation, not a prerequisite. These gifts don't make you saved. 
these gifts are a gift that are a part of your salvation experience as a part of your journey towards sanctification that is uh, to edify yourself and others, right? And so that's those are the characteristics of the contemporary charismatic movement. But then we discover three major problems uh, that need to be tackled when we talk about the charismatic movement, uh, both uh, in the early church and even today. And that is the risk of there becoming division, the risk of division. You may see it in your church, uh, or and you may have seen it in other churches, but uh, division in the church is usually caused by a sense of superiority because one has experienced something others have not especially when you think about the, the, the supernatural gifts listed in 1 Corinthians 12. In other words, uh, I have uh, given a word of prophecy and no one else has done that in, in, in my circle, or I, I speak in tongues or I've given a message in tongues and no one else has done that. That, that, that gives this air of superiority as if you are at a higher uh, a plane of Christianity than others. I have more of the Holy Spirit than others. And that creates a problem of division. And that's where you find out you have churches that either are all in 100% on the charismatic experience or all out because they don't want to be a part of that exclusiveness. And that creates division within the church. The second problem is uh, these uh, uh, emphasis or a lack of emphasis are because of improper biblical t interpretation. On both sides of the spectrum, you have individuals that will find their favorite proof text to prove uh, and support their charismatic experiences or to disprove charismatic experiences. And what we've got to do is stop using selective text to prove or disprove one's experience or lack of experience. And what happens is that uh, the feeling that because one has had such an experience, everyone should have that experience. I might go to a restaurant and taste something that was delicious, and I will make some... You got to eat this. It's so good. And I can't believe you don't like it. I loved it. It tastes so good to me. How can you not like it? And so uh, what we've got to understand is this, uh, there's a, a idea called pluralism. And pluralism means that everyone comes from a different background and everyone has had different experiences. And that di those different backgrounds and those different experiences inform and influence everyone's perspective on these particular matters. Some may come from a background that never even have seen or witnessed a charismatic experience. And so when they walk into it, they have no frame of reference to understand it. And so th th there needs to be uh, teaching and there needs to be uh, guidance along those lines, not a complete shunning because you haven't had that experience or, or continuing to try to uh, improperly force that experience and vice versa. Right. Uh, those who come from a background uh, that uh, have and, and the charismatic experience is normal to them uh, being uncomfortable by those who just uh, don't understand it or don't get it. Right. And so we've got to make sure that both of our experiences are balanced by proper biblical interpretation. And that's why we have teachings like this, right? Um, and so it, it requires proper teaching on both sides so that there is not an imbalance. Uh, and then there's losing sight of the mission. Uh, there sometimes becomes such an emphasis on the gifts of the spirit that we lose focus and sight on the purpose by which these gifts are used as tools. An improper emphasis can take away from the overall mission of the Holy Spirit in the first place. Remember, the apostles, the disciples waited in Jerusalem to be clothed with power from on high, and they were waiting there so that they could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the gift of the Holy Spirit so that was so that they could be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to empower us for mission. And these gifts of the Holy Spirit were a tool that draws people to 
the gospel. That's why we see signs, wonders, and miracles happening throughout the book of Acts, not to just show off signs, wonders, and miracles, but to accompany the gospel that is being preached as a means of grace to draw others to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it would the, the, we need to make sure that in our teaching and in our embracing of the charismatic experience, it doesn't make us lose sight that the mission of the Holy Spirit is salvation. The gospel is to evangelize. It is to make sure people are drawn to Christ, not to the individual with the so-called gift. Amen. So now let's move on to Wesley in, in the charismatic movement. What did he believe about it? What did he feel about it. Well, first thing, one thing I want to do is share with you from another book that um, it's called The Holy Spirit and Power. The Holy Spirit and Power. And this is a book that actually uh, takes uh, several of John Wesley's teachings specifically on the Holy Spirit and combine them into one volume. So this book actually has Wesley's literal sermons and or writings on different topics of the Holy Spirit. And one it, one of the chapters is about the gifts of the Spirit, and it is a letter written by Wesley uh, in response to a publication by uh, a gentleman named Dr. Conyers Middleton. And that publication uh, specifically denied the existence of the gifts of the Spirit. And the basis of that denial was that we don't see them in our modern times, and we have not seen them recorded. Wesley's argument to that includes this. Um, the question is, why are not miracles performed still? Why are there no persons who raise the dead and cure diseases? To which he replies that it was due to lack of faith, virtue, and piety in those times. So even when discussing that, we see Wesley emphasizing the idea of sanctification, emphasizing the idea of holiness. Uh, the cause of this was not as has been vaguely supposed, that there was no more need or occasion for them because all the world had become Christian. This is a terrible mistake. Not a 20th part of the world was then nominally Christian. So Wesley says this, the real cause of the loss was that the love of many, almost all the so-called Christians, had grown cold, had grown Cold. So the issue of whether or not uh, the gifts of the Spirit uh, were valid for today should not be based on whether or not you saw much of it or whether there was not a, a, a lot of recording of it. It was because what we must understand, there needs to be a self-evaluation of the, uh, the, the, the church and the self-evaluation of oneself and their commitment to their faith as it leads to sanctification and much of the world. Uh, John Wesley argues, had grown cold. And because of that, if there was no um, true embracing of the Holy Spirit as a part of one's journey towards sanctification, then, of course, the presence of the Holy Spirit in his activity will not be seen. Right. And so what we now know is that Wesley uh, embraced and believed that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were available today. Uh, but one thing we've got to understand that is that he builds that into his uh, main teachings of the witness of the Spirit. We see uh, Wesley's teaching of the witness of the Spirit uh, being an inward confirmation of reconciliation. An inward confirmation of reconciliation. In Romans 8 and 16, we see Paul writing, um, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so the witness of the Spirit is what, what be similar of um, what his heartwarming experience was. It is that actual feeling of confirmation, that witness of the Holy Spirit that confirms in you that you are a child of God. And when that confirmation of reconciliation takes place, the, 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 what, what, is, what is expected to uh, come from that are the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. We find that in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And so those who have the witness of the Spirit uh, 
uh, should also see the resulting fruits of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit should be uh, should further align with the fruit of the spirit. In other words, if you are exhibiting so-called gifts of the spirit, but you are not producing the fruit of the spirit, then your so-called gifts should be called into question. Because the focus should be on your uh, spiritual journey towards sanctification and holiness, and the gifts of the Spirit are a tool to that end, not an end into itself. And so we must, by through the witness of the Holy Spirit, begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit should lead to holiness and Christian love. The same Spirit that gave gifts produce the love of Christ and Christian perfection. There are some scriptures that I want to pull together that help support this. First of all, you see in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 31, we see Paul saying, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. He's asking, does, does everyone have all the gifts? Does everyone uh, um, have the gift of healing or speak with tongues? Do all interpret? He encourages them to desire the best gifts and spiritual gifts, but then he goes on to talk about showing a more excellent way. And there he goes into 1 Corinthians 13, which is the uh, proverbial love chapter, to be able to say that even if I had all of these gifts, if I don't have love, it doesn't matter. And then he moves on to uh, 1 Corinthians 14, where he begins to focus his attention on speaking in tongues, prophecy, and interpretation. And in verse 1 of 14, he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. A lot of times people look at 1 Corinthians 14 as Paul uh, condemning speaking in tongues. He's not. He is uh, correcting the improper use of speaking in tongues and spiritual gifts within the church. But we see in the very first verse, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And then even at the very end of chapter 14 and verse 39, he says, therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. What do we see as the common theme in these scriptures so far? He's saying pursue love and pursue gifts. Pursue love and pursue gifts, right? And then in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says this, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. What are we pursuing? The end goal is holiness. The end goal is sanctification. The spiritual gifts should be pursued as a tool toward that end goal, not an end unto itself. And so spiritual gifts are not being de-emphasized. They are being put in their proper, proper place in, as, in its role and tool toward sanctification and holiness. Right. And so uh, in our pursuit for Christian love, in our pursuit for holiness, the spiritual gifts, those charismatic experiences are a tool that Christians can and will experience if they pursue them as a part of uh, holiness and Christian love. Amen. And so Wesley did not discourage. As a matter of fact, he encouraged it as much as Paul encouraged it. Pursue them, seek them, but seek love as the end goal, because that is the greater of all things. If you don't have love, none of that falls into place. Amen. And so now, now that we understand this, what do we, what do we mean? What do we learn? What do we understand? What we understand uh, at this point is that, uh, first of all, Wesley uh, did not in any way deny, discourage the utilization of spiritual gifts. Uh, many writings show that uh, he witnessed them in part as part of his revivals, and he defended them 
in his writings. He, uh, in, in the book I just referenced, The Holy Spirit and Power, actually wrote of uh, other historical experiences and writers that spoke of the activity of the Holy Spirit. So in plain terms, the charismatic experience or spiritual gifts are valid for today, for the church, and are helpful for uh, helping one another right? Uh, and these spiritual gifts, Paul says, can be pursued along with the ultimate pursuit of love and holiness. That's what I want us to understand, number one, is that uh, the church can and should create an environment where the charismatic experience is welcome, but not improperly emphasized. That leads me into some guidelines for charismatic uh, experiences, some guidelines for charismatic experiences. Now, these guidelines are excerpts that have been borrowed from segments of a statement by the United Methodist Church 1976 General Conference, and they approved these guidelines for uh, 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 clergy and laity for those who have and have not had charismatic experiences. This is, uh, there is a much exhaustive list. I have highlighted just a few. Uh, firstly, guidelines for all. Be open and accepting to those whose Christian experiences differ from your own. Be open and accepting to those whose Christian experiences differ from your own. That's for those who have had charismatic experiences and those who have had who have not had charismatic experiences recognize that even though spiritual gifts may be abused this does not mean they should be prohibited the abuse of the right thing should not be a denial or uh, 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 abandoning of that right thing right just because someone abuses something doesn't mean the thing is wrong it means it was used improperly. Recognize that even though spiritual gifts may be abused, this does not mean they should be prohibited. And remember, like any other new movements in church history, the charismatic renewal has a valid contribution to make to the ecumenical church. In other words, every church could benefit from the charismatic experience. There need not be a charismatic church right? There need not be a segmented charismatic movement. The charismatic experience can be experienced by all churches if they are willing to embrace it in its proper context to create an ecumenical or equal uh, a, a, or united experience among all churches. Amen. Uh, and then some guidelines for laity, uh, those who have had charismatic experiences and those who have not had charismatic experience. Those who have had charismatic experience are to strive for a scholarly knowledge of script scriptural content in combination with your spiritual experiences. In other words, make sure you know your Bible, <laughs> make sure you know the scriptures and make sure you know your doctrine, right? Uh, so that you do not uh, become undisciplined and undiplomatic in your enthusiasm, in your eagerness to share your experience with others, right? Be careful about that. Avoid undisciplined and undiplomatic enthusiasm in your eagerness to share your experiences with others and keep your charismatic experience in perspective. That is your charismatic experience. And, and what we must understand is experience is not in itself doctrine. Experience is not in itself doctrine. Uh, just because it happened to you in a certain way that it happened to you doesn't mean that it has to happen to someone else in that way, right? All of that needs to be built into the perspective of the Bible. Uh, and then for those who have not had charismatic experiences, be aware of the tendency to separate ourselves from those who have had experiences different from our own. Do not be disturbed if your experience is different from others. This does not mean you are an inferior Christian. You have the same Holy Spirit within you as those who have had those uh, charismatic experience have within them. There is no greater 
uh, uh, amount of the Holy Spirit that one has different from others. We all have the same Holy Spirit within us. Uh, it, it just others have had different experiences or no experiences for various reasons. Amen. It doesn't make you an inferior Christian. And finally, should your pastor be a charismatic? Help him or her to be mindful of the spiritual needs for all the congregation, to be a pastor and teacher to all, and encourage her or him in preaching to present the wholeness of all aspects of the gospel. In other words, if your pastor is a charismatic, he should not uh, teach in a way where it only focuses on those who have had those ex those experiences and creates an environment where it excludes those. Any preacher, whether they've had charismatic experiences or not, need to preach the whole gospel, not a uh, cherry-picked gospel. I, I, I pointed that particular bullet point out because I think it's important, especially for those who are members of Redeemed Chapel, to know this uh, both uh, by uh, for the purposes of transparency and for the purposes of accountability, that I am that pastor. I am that pastor that has had, currently have, and currently encourage charismatic experiences, right? And so uh, it is important that those who sit under me know that about me uh, and, and, and understand that. Uh, but I also present it as a point of accountability so that I know my responsibility to my members to preach the whole gospel and not just a segmented gospel just because of my charismatic experiences. Amen. And so uh, it's very, very important that all of us, including myself, put all of these experiences in perspective. I intend to create an environment where we can have that spiritual renewal that includes those experiences, but want to be accountable and do it in a way where it does not exclude others who have not and be sure to preach the whole gospel. Because I believe when the whole gospel is preached, just like in the books, uh, book of Acts, we can expect signs, wonders, and miracles to follow. So my goal is to preach the gospel. And when the gospel is preached, the Holy Spirit uh, is 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 uh, going to come within those who have become saved as a part of the new birth. And as a part of that new birth, that sanctification as a second work of grace creates an ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit in one's life so that they can experience those gifts. Amen. We're going to go into those gifts in more detail in a couple of weeks when we begin our uh, teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I know I went long today, but this was a very sensitive and important topic that I think is uh, critical for us to learn and understand, especially if I'm going to continue to be the pastor <laughs> of Redeemed Chapel for any period of time uh, to understand where I stand on these topics. Thank you so much, Sister Carla Lewis, uh, for sharing. You provided an excellent explanation of the charismatic movement, its benefits and acceptance of those who have had specific charismatic gifts. Thank you so much for uh, those thoughts and that perspective. So I want to close it by summarizing it this way. Uh, as we come to a close, let's remember that the Holy Spirit empowers with an inner witness and outward manifestation. The inner witness of the Holy Spirit confirms with us that we are children of God and that results in outward manifestation through spiritual gifts. The manifested gifts should be used for the common good. They should be used for the common good. And that common good should be that the love of Christ is shown in all. Love is the greatest of all virtues. And the pursuit of gifts are part of the ultimate pursuit of, of holiness. The pursuit of gifts are part of the ultimate pursuit of holiness. And that is what Wesley w Wesley's goal was in his teaching on the Christian experience through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on PowerPoint Tuesday with Pastor Jeremiah. Remember, the Word of God is a light unto your path. Until next time, stay blessed, stay inspired, and let God's wisdom guide you. This is Pastor Jeremiah saying, I love you, God loves you, 
keep yourselves in the love of God.